Okay, a very good morning to you. I am Dr. Lia Susana Deichmann, president of ILC Argentina. Um, the symposium that we are going to present today um, by the ILC Global Alliance is a name, protecting the human rights of all the persons, sharing insight on all the person's experience, ageism and advocacy during the pandemic. The International Longevity Center Global Alliance, which is a, an international consortium of member organizations with United Nations consultative status. The mission is to help societies to address longevity and population aging in positive and productive ways, typically using a life course approach highlighting older people's productivity and contributions to family and society as a whole. The Alliance member organizations carry out the mission through developing ideas, undertaking research and creating forums for debate and action in which older people are case stakeholders. The first International Longevity Center were established in the United States in 1990 by Dr. Robert Butler and in Japan by Mr. Shigeo Morioka, ex-CEO of Yamanuchi Pharmaceutical from Japan. The ILC Global Alliance currently includes centers in the United States of America, Japan, the United Kingdom, France, the Dominican Republic, India, South Africa, Argentina the Netherlands, Israel, Singapore, Czech Republic, Brazil, China, China, Australia, and Canada. These centers work autonomously and collaboratively to study how greater life expectancy and increased proportions of older people impact on nations around the world. Our priorities are to identify productive aging as an important topic, not just paid employment, but also as the continued talent and contribution of all the people and to promote educational research and policy initiatives which will advance an active healthy life throughout the life course. In 2020, we were happy to celebrate our 30th anniversary. Okay, respect the the, the, the symposium. Uh, globally, COVID-19 has led to debilitating effects and post significant human rights challenge for older people. Healthcare measures and societal responses to COVID-19 have impacted older persons' mental and physical well-being, amplify ageism, and heighten the risk of elder abuse. The symposium will consider how older people from various ILC countries across the globe have been impacted by COVID-19, the ageism they have experienced and their resilience. The ILC Global Alliance will present on the advocacy work they have been doing throughout the pandemic and their collaborative effort to track the impact of the pandemic on all the persons at national and individual levels, including people living in different communities and institutional settings. The presentations will feature updates to the report in the pandemic and the human rights for all the person and cross country quality research into the experience of individuals living in the community and in aged care. I will introduce <clears throat> now the first speaker who is Professor Julie Biles. Uh, she's a Bachelor of Medicine. She's Doctor in Philosophy fellow of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Science, director of the ILC Australia, co-president of the ILC Global Alliance, chair of the International Association of Gerontology for Asia and Oceania, social research and planning sub subcommittee. Professor Biles research interest in aging, including the role of health services, preventive activities and treatment in maintaining quality of life of older people. Uh, please, uh, Julie, uh, it's your time. 
Hi, I'm Julie Biles, and I'm going to talk about a report that we did for the ILC Global Alliance, where we surveyed 16 countries in the Alliance, uh, largely through 2020 and also 2021, to understand the way in which the COVID pandemic and the response was affecting older people in those countries. So globally, the COVID-19 pandemic posed significant human rights challenges for older persons. And in the report that we produced, which is on the ILC Global Alliance website, we present insights into the impacts of the pandemic across 16 countries in the International Global uh, International Longevity Centre Global Alliance. We also consider the policy and practical responses to the pandemic. So COVID was a global or is a global pandemic, but it hasn't affected all countries equally. Here we see epidemic curves for Brazil, USA and Brazil across the top, India and France in the middle, and South Africa and Singapore down the bottom. And you can see just from those counts in those curves that both the case rates and the death rates were not only different in magnitude, but also different in timing across the different countries. We see multiple outbreaks, not one pandemic, and a different relationship between known cases and deaths in the different countries. So um, for instance, we see a very high number of deaths relative to cases in the USA and other countries such as Singapore on the bottom right hand of the slide seem to be able to keep the outbreaks at bay until more recent times. The response to COVID also varied from country to country and from time to time. Here we see a summation of response indicators, including school closures, workplace closures, travel bans, testing policies, contract tracing, face coverings, vaccine and vaccine policy. Um, if policies um, and, and showing the variation in this stringency of different policies across different countries around the globe. This map here is for the 6th of May. And if you go onto the Our World in Data site, you can slide along and see how these policies have changed across the countries over time. What the map shows for the 6th of May uh, and for most states is that um, there are strict restrictions in some parts of the globe and more lax restrictions in others. However, from the 1st of January 2020, almost every country with, um, uh, in the world had implemented varying levels of stay at home requirements to protect citizens from COVID-19. Um, and almost in every country uh, also implemented policies around face covering and, um, and social distancing, uh, hand washing, use of public transport, closure of outdoor events, etc. Um, however, despite being termed a great equaliser, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed health inequities experienced by individuals and communities with a growing body of evidence highlighting the effects of social, economic and environmental determinants on health outcomes and vulnerability to COVID, as well as the effects of COVID on existing inequalities. Societies globally have a collective responsibility to protect and uh, support people who've been made vulnerable, um, both before, throughout and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. It's therefore important for us to learn from each other and find the best ways to do that and to take action. One of the most important actions has been vaccination, but vaccination policies have varied across the globe as well. And the rates of uptake have varied across the globe, across age groups, and across socioeconomic strata. We know that vaccines save lives and that vaccinations are an important step towards managing the spread of the COVID-19 virus. This is again the COVID-19 stringency index, but showing how it's changed over time in United States, Canada, United Kingdom, France, Argentina, Australia, Brazil, China, Singapore, and South Africa. And it also shows how the stringencies varied for those who were not vaccinated in red, 
where higher levels of stringencies applied uh, and the vaccinated in green where greater freedoms could be afforded to them. The impacts on older persons were wide ranging from threats to income, mental health effects due to social isolation and anxiety, risks of infection, lack of access to essential medical and social care, and an increased risk of abuse and neglect. A WHO survey released as early as June 2020 provided evidence of severe disruption to prevention and treatment healthcare services for non-communicable diseases since the beginning of the pandemic, with lower income countries being the worst affected. The results of these disruptions could lead to unprecedented consequences for the health of people with non-communicable disease. For example, in the UK, as part of the national lockdown, cancer screening and diagnostic services were suspended or deferred. A national modelling study found that the diagnostic delays are expected to increase the number of preventable cancer deaths, including an estimated 7.9 to 9.6% increase in deaths of up to five years after diagnosis as a result of breast cancer, 15 to 16% increase in deaths for colorectal cancer, and around a 5% increase in deaths for lung cancer, and around a 6% increase in deaths for esophageal cancer. The cancellation of elliptic surgeries was another measure undertaken in various countries in an attempt to relieve the burden on the healthcare system. A modelling study, study undertaken um, by COVID Surge Collaborative projected that 28.4 million elective surgeries globally would be postponed or cancelled due to COVID in 2020. The long-term impact of these cancellations is still yet to be determined. So while our immediate concerns about COVID might have been about infection, the broader concerns may be far more um, important and far reaching. Less visible, but no less worrying, um, are effects such as healthcare denied for conditions unrelated to COVID, neglect and abuse in institutions and care facilities, an increase in poverty and unemployment, the dramatic impact on wellbeing and mental health, and the trauma of stigma and discrimination. Let's have a look at some case studies of the mental uh, health and health impact of COVID in different countries. In Japan, some people felt no changes in their mental health, while others found that dealing with the pandemic was difficult, um, particularly when they felt they had nothing to do. Some people felt no changes in their physical health or were able to restore, maintain or restore strength and function when the restrictions eased and they're able to engage with physical activity again. However, others reported decline in physical strength, physical function, cognitive function, and that they gained weight. In Canada, delayed or canceled medical or dental appointments, including surgeries for joint replacements and cancer, cardiac and cataract operations are caused public health concerns about the impact on older people's physical and mental health. In the Netherlands, a lack of personal freedom and self-determination um, was observed. Many older adults expressed feeling a sense of isolation, both in physical terms as well as socially, and the loss of meaningful activities. Others expressed a loss in self-determination because they could simply no longer determine what they would like to do. What about the socioeconomic impacts? In Singapore, it was reported that un unemployment rates didn't change for older people because there was an increased demand for the industries that older people are traditionally engaged in, such as security or cleaning. And in fact, due to increased demands for these services, their employment rates may have gone up. The Skills Future Scheme was also launched by the Government of Singapore to help people, including older people, who'd been displaced from work during the pandemic to find new jobs, with older people also receiving an hourly payment for completing the course. In India, a study by Help Age India revealed that an estimated 65% of older people's livelihoods were impacted by COVID. 
approximately 71% of older respondents stated that the family's sole breadwinner had experienced the loss of work or suffered income restrictions due to the lockdown. A further 78% of people faced challenges accessing essential goods and services across the country. What about the experiences of older persons in long-term care? In Australia, most residents of aged care homes had not experienced COVID, although when they did, it was pretty catastrophic. But while in most of the homes there was no COVID, but they had endured restrictions for almost the entire year and still do that go beyond those endured by the general community. The restrictions limited visits by family and attendances by healthcare providers. They also increased the staff workloads and reduced the instrumental and expressive care that could be provided by families. As a consequence, the older people's physical and mental health was put at risk. In Canada, there were dramatic events where the armed forces were um, brought in to where aged care workers were not available in uh, residential care facilities. And they found many, many instances of regulatory violations and neglect. But there were some positive experiences for people living in long-term care as well. In the Netherlands, despite the lockdown, the residents kept in contact with their relatives using creative means. Um, look, maybe acquaintances waved from outside or dropped off presents, and then the residents felt happier less drearier and less alone. In India, in most of the aged care homes and retirement communities, the older people were treated with more care and extra attention uh, was paid to their health. And they had uh, sanitization and disinfection measures taken out by the authorities. And they actually ended up with uh, a lower prevalence of cases and a lower case fatality rate. However, elder abuse was a consequence of the pandemic and the restrictions associated with the pandemic. In India, again, 71% of the older population said that elder abuse frequency had increased during COVID and 64% of older adults reported neglect. Much of that abuse was perpetrated by an immediate family member, such as a son or daughter or daughters-in-law. And most older adults felt really helpless as they had no one to turn to. Um, and this elder abuse increase has been attributed to the stresses on the families, as well as intergenerational um, and interpersonal tensions. Some groups were at particular disadvantage. Um, in Australia, the Prime Minister announced a health package designed to protect Australians, particularly vulnerable groups, such as the elderly from the virus. This included money for aged care, the aged care sector to implement measures such as education and training of the workers in infection control, hiring extra nurses and aged care workers, and making available um, additional care staff where necessary. In Singapore, the authorities, welfare groups, religious organisations pulled together to offer homeless individuals interim housing that provided meals and access to hygiene facilities. And in fact, conditions for homeless people might have been better during the lockdown period. Important was to maintain the services for older people. In India, all essential services were uh, protected um, and many voluntary and self-help groups established their own networks and coordinated supplies of goods and services. In Australia, the government extended phone and video conference telehealth services, and some comp uh, grocery companies protected times when older people sh could shop and gave priority to older people for home deliveries. One of the other effects of the pandemic has been an exacerbation of ageism. The COVID pandemic has led to um, an increase in ageism, even within older age groups. Ageism is a process by which older people are negatively stereotyped and portrayed as a homogenous group, one that poses demographic, social and financial challenges. It's expressed through individual and systemic discriminatory behaviour before old, towards older adults, such as indifference, patronising attitudes 
and in its worst form, abandonment. During COVID, ageism has manifested in multiple societies across the world. And the discriminatory practices and public discourse about older adults during COVID has only worsened ageism. In some cases, the older population was disproportionately affected by restrictive policies to curtail the virus and seen as protective measures to safeguard their well-being. As a consequence, there was an increase in loneliness, social isolation, ageist stereotypes. In some cases, medical care, or for instance, access to ventilators in intensive care units was assigned on the basis of chronological age. Another problem for older people during the COVID pandemic was that there was an increased reliance on digital media, the internet, and things such as Zoom and other ways of communicating, accessing services, accessing information. With increasing dependence on technology and the internet for services, older people who were not connected or didn't have stable technology could be left behind. Finally, we look at the relationship between COVID which occurred right at the beginning of the decade of healthy ageing. <coughs> this, this global collaboration aligns the sustainable development goals to the needs of older people. The aim is to begin governments and civil society, international agencies, professionals, academia, the media and the private sector together to improve the lives of older people. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the, the pandemic and the response to it has increased the importance of the decade's goals, but has also set back their achievement. Countries and organisations that support older people need to now double down on their efforts to improve the experience of ageing and to protect the rights of older persons. If you want more information on the report and what it contains, the report is available on the International Longevity Centre Global Alliance website. And here's the website address at ilcalliance.org. Thank you very much. Now the second presentation will be from, um, ah, the name of the presentation is Experience of COVID-19 Insight from Research with Older People. This presentation will be done by Professor Tinike Abma, who is the Executive Director of Leiden Academy of Vitality and Aging. For over 25 years, she has been researching themes closely related to aging, such as patient and citizen participation, long-term care, ethics, and diversity. Taking the perspective of older individual as a starting point and respecting and valuing the differences between people is her personal motivation and key characteristic in the research and activities of the Leiden Academy. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be part of this panel on the human rights of older people during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Tineke Atma, and I'm a professor at the Leiden University Medical Center in the Department of Public Health. I'm also the executive director of Leiden Academy on Vitality and Aging, which is the representative of ELC, the Netherlands. It is our mission to contribute to the quality of life of older people as a knowledge institution. And we do so with a group of interdisciplinary scholars. Today, I will focus on the older people's experiences with the COVID-19 pandemic. March. 2020, we developed a study protocol because we saw that the protective measures established to protect people from COVID-19 were also influencing their quality of life and well-being, while their voices were not heard. 
So this project aimed to explore the meaning of the pandemic among a diverse group of seniors, age 60 plus worldwide, and how the pandemic impacts their daily lives. We chose a qualitative study design with semi-structured interviews with seniors age 60 plus. The interviews were mainly done by telephone, audio recorded and transcribed verbatim. We used a purposeful sampling method to include as many seniors as possible, also those with a lower social economic status and the oldest old. The topics for the interviews included social context, social activities, health and vitality, well-being, and the corona news and reporting. Later on, we also included human rights. An inductive thematic analysis was conducted and regularly we held group conversations over the um, two years. Here you see the various countries that took part in our study, the Netherlands, Brazil, Canada, Japan, Singapore, the Dominican Republic, and Iran. From the study, we derived policy recommendations, involve seniors in policymaking, beware of ageist language, beware of the digital divide, focus on coping and resilience, ensure social participation and volunteering. And I will now um, go on and um, report about the various recommendations. Involve seniors in policymaking. The measures established to protect seniors uh, affected their um, quality of life, but they had no or little influence on the policymaking process, which led to frustrations about having no say and measures that did not attune to their needs. If policymakers do not involve seniors, they will not know what the needs are under the circumstances. So seniors must be involved in policymaking, not only in the beginning, but throughout the policy cycle, from agenda setting, planning, to implementation and evaluation. And we also advise to establish structural partnerships um, to be prepared for a next crisis. The second recommendation, beware of ageist language. Many seniors felt scaffolded by the language used in mass communications. They were portrayed as vulnerable and weak, and many elders had the idea that they were a burden on the rest of society. This is an example of a lady from the Netherlands who said, I do not feel addressed. Many people who are older are still very independent and self-sufficient. So she found the reporting somewhat patronizing. This means that language matters because it can reproduce and fuel ageism. And if seniors are affected by the use of certain terminologies, they should have a say in how to use language that better represents their situation and position. And also we can involve them in determining what ageist and stigmatizing language is in order to better portray them. The third recommendation, be aware of the digital divide. We have seen how social distancing um, led to social isolation and how important digital technology is to stay connected with friends, family, and be engaged in the community. And it's also an important um, way to understand the implications of the crisis and search for the right care. Here are some experiences from people uh, around the world. Someone from Japan who started to use digital technology because her family advised her to do so. Or someone from Canada who said, it's not ideal soon, but it's a way to stay connected with another human being. And someone from the Netherlands who was very enthusiastic about uh, the WhatsApp uh, through which she held contact with her children, grandchildren. Um, so 
we should not assume that seniors are digitally illiterate. We have seen that people um, rapidly increase their digital skills. But we do have to acknowledge that not all people have the resources to keep uh, up with these developments and have uh, the resources to buy the necessary uh, technology. And here we see often a combination of disadvantages where class matters often more than age. So the recommendation is to make technology available, set up community platforms and digital ambassador. The fourth recommendation focus on coping and resilience. Policies were targeted to protect all the people um, and focused on risks. Um, deriving from a medical model on old age, um, which led the attention away from the capacities of all the people and their coping and resilience. While we saw that many had uh, uh, skills to cope very well with um, the situation, um, for example, people were very um, uh, good at selecting and filtering the news. Someone from Brazil, for example, said, I prefer to um, avoid the news. Um, and someone uh, said, uh, you get so stressed by all these uh, graphical re representations of death. And someone from Canada also said um, how the news made them anxious and how they um, curtailed watching the news from the States. So a uh, focus on the development of capacities, not only of in individuals, but also of groups and communities and ask seniors, what are the assets and resources that can be mobilized within your community? So they will be prepared for the next crisis. Ensure social participation and volunteering. Many seniors lost the possibility to participate in social activities, voluntary work and paid jobs. This not only meant a loss of income, but also of meaningful activities and roles. So ensure that they can partake in society. And some experiences from abroad, people from Japan who started to disinfect the elevator buttons on a voluntary basis, or someone from the Netherlands who was um, working in the hospital and found it very nice to make himself useful. Future policies to keep in mind that people want to maintain their day-to-day -day activities and um, acknowledge the importance of meaningful activities uh, and roles in society. I come to my conclusions. People should be addressed as agents and as valuable members of society. The digital divide, ages, language, and other issues require attention to prevent health inequalities, loneliness, sadness, and loss of meaning in societal role. These recommendations will help us better in the future to attune um, our policy measures to the needs and desires of old, older people. Thank you for your attention. I want to acknowledge all the participating ELCs and members of our teams from Japan from Singapore, from South Africa, the Dominican Republic, Brazil, the USA, and Canada. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, Tineke, for your presentation. It has been really very, very interesting. And um, I'm very pleased that you are with us. Now. Um, the third presentation, the third speaker, who will be talking about the COVID-19 pandemic impact on autonomy, connection, and the human rights of older people. She is Louise Belanger Hardy. She is a law professor at the Faculty of Law of the University of Ottawa, Canada. She teaches tort law and medical law. Her current research interests include human rights of older people and the rights of caregivers and patients in long-term care and liability issues and private home care. She is a member of the Life Research Institute of the University of Ottawa and an associate with the International Longevity Center Canada. 
She has been a member of research ethics boards at the University of Ottawa, Canadian Blood Services and Health Canada. She is a member of the Bar of Ontario, Canada. Uh, it is my pleasure to give you the floor, uh, Louise. Hello, my name is Louise Belanger Hardy, and I'm pleased to join my ILC Global Alliance colleagues for this presentation based on the Canadian experience of the COVID-19 pandemic. In Canada, there have been 3.8 million COVID cases and about 40,000 deaths so far. Importantly, 21% of these deaths were people in the 70 to 79 year old bracket and 60% in the plus 80 age bracket. And in particular, in, long, long, in terms of long-term care, uh, although the cases amounted to only 3% of all COVID cases, a, a large figure of 43% uh, of COVID-19 uh, deaths occurred in that uh, setting. Other older adults situation pre-pandemic was not optimal and the problems were exacerbated by the pandemic. You can see here the challenges that existed before the pandemic uh, occurred and sadly uh, continue to exist. Ageism is there because of its overwhelming presence in our society. During the pandemic, it manifested itself by a lack of planning and preparedness by public health bodies, even after it became clear based on other countries' experience that older, the older population was very much at risk. The health crisis highlighted as well the shortage of health care staff, especially personal care workers, who assist in long-term care homes and in the community. They are overworked, poorly paid, and their specialized skills are neither recognized nor valued. This continues to be a challenge. And we are currently, for example, experiencing a shortage in nursing. In the thick of the pandemic in Ontario, which is Canada's most populous province, and where 60% of, of our long-term care and, re and older people's residences are privately owned for profit, the Canadian Army Armed Forces had to be called in uh, to assist residents in five locations. The forces produced a report that revealed severe instances of regulatory violations and neglect, non-adherence with non existent or non-existence of policies, inadequate resources to train staff, lack of medical supplies, deficiencies in infrastructure, for example, inadequate disinfection of patients, concerns about standard of care, for example, treatment of um, pressure ulcers, and finally, unfortunately, violence against residents. So Ontarians and other Canadians were utterly shocked by this report. As is well known, autonomy and connection are vital throughout a person's lifespan. During the pandemic, they were both compromised, especially for older persons. In terms of autonomy, defined here as having a sense of choice and volition in the regulation of one's behavior, public health measures meant that people had less opportunity, opportunities to make choices from food to entertainment to social activities. There was increased dependence on others for all sorts of activities. And, and as well, health measures were imposed without consultation. In terms of connection, public health measures meant that there was less contact with family members, friends, and caregivers. There was dependence on inadequate technology literacy at some point, and on poor technology know-how, so it was difficult to communicate. There was a reduction, as we know, of social and other leisure activities, and this led to loneliness, mental health issues, and in some cases, sadly, it meant dying alone. Keeping the problems outlined in mind, what can be done to deal with them? We are now entering a recovery phase, and this is a good time to rethink our approach. The suggestion made here is that a human rights-based approach 
should be considered as a way to assist in preventing some of the problems associated not only with the pandemic, but as well with the manner in which older persons are generally treated in society. What would such an approach entail? Well, based, it is an approach, first of all, that is based on international human rights standards, including dignity and equality and, and others. It is an approach supported by a substantial body of largely agreed norms. So it's not a new idea, but it's a new focus. Human rights should become a main organizing framework when addressing problems and challenges regarding older adults. The framework can apply to a variety of settings from government bodies to institutions to businesses. And importantly, under this framework, public policy is conceptualized with the objective of enhancing human rights. There are a number of related concepts uh, to the uh, human rights based approach, including transparency in decision making, accountability, non-discrimination and participation, which is particularly important and which we'll discuss in a minute. Usually the human-based um, approach focuses on vulnerable groups and um, although older adults are not always vulnerable, a uh, portion of them are, as can be shown, as was shown by the pandemic. What would it look like if the focus was on human rights going forward? To apply a human rights-based approach, one starts by identifying specific rights. A few of these rights have been noted here, but others could have been chosen. The three rights listed on this slide are, are, are particularly relevant. They are confirmed by international treaties to which most world countries have signed on. Taking the right to health, for example, this means that going forward, policies must consider physical, but importantly, the mental health of older persons and their caregivers, health professionals and informal caregivers. It also means that funding must be provided to attend the highest standard of health possible. Regarding the right to, free, to be free from discrimination, we know that age is a protected ground of discrimination in many, but not all, human rights instruments. However, older persons are often not aware of their human rights, and, access, and they don't necessarily have access to the mechanisms that exist to protect these rights. This must be addressed. Um, restrictive measures who can be necessary in a situation like a pandemic must can be, of course, adopted, but they must not discriminate and must be subject to reasonable limits that can be demonstrably justified as necessary, legitimate, and proportionate. And under the right to, to be free from discrimination, one can find as well the obligation to combat ageism. And so far as the right to take part in cultural and social activities, this may seem at the outset to be less important at first glance, but consider that participation is a key element of the human rights-based approach. Therefore, it is a crucial part of inclusive participatory decision-making. So it's important to involve older persons, offer real choices, and provide the financial and the physical support in order to uh, achieve this right. So the human rights-based agenda going forward is an added value during the recovery phase of the pandemic and of course beyond. Four key action points are proposed. This approach must be adopted at every level of government. Mechanisms of participatory decision-making must be created. Training on the human rights-based approach must be developed. And finally, a United Nations Convention on the Rights of Older Persons must be supported by all states. For over 15 years, many actors of the, in the, inter, of the international community have been pushing for this development. Such a convention is crucial to ensure that all states reach the same level of commitment towards older adults, 
especially since currently human rights protection is not uniform and is lacking in key areas. Promoting the need for such a convention is the responsibility of everyone, whatever their age. And it is the responsibility of everyone to ensure autonomy, connection, dignity, and the best quality of life possible for all of us as we age. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Louise, for your presentation. It was really great, and we enjoyed it very, very much. And now I am going to introduce um, a colleague of mine, um, very well known around the world, and uh, he will be presenting on advocating for the human rights of all the persons during COVID-19. He's uh, Dr. Alessandro Galacci, he's a medical epidemiologist specializing in the study of aging. Since 2012, he has been the president of the International Longevity Center of Brazil and in 2015, co president of the Global Alliance of International Longevity Centers. He formally directed the World Health Organization's Global Aging Program at its Geneva headquarters, following an academic career largely at the universities of London and Oxford in the United Kingdom. Kalachi has researched, written, and spoken in the field of aging issues as an academic and international civil servant and as a tireless and committed advocate. I'm going to talk about the experience of COVID pandemic in Brazil, the greatest sanitary crisis in our history. So far, 700,000 deaths. But there were many more victims. Where is my grandmother? Where is my father? Where is my son? Where is my neighbor? Where is my best friend, all that leading to grief, bereavement, suffering, loss of income. Because in a poor country like Brazil, when another person dies, it is the only regular source of income for that whole family. It's what brings food to the grandchildren medicine to your child who has got tuberculosis. All this is not taken into account. Women have been the greatest victims. They were the first to lose their precarious jobs. They had to go back home to look after their children and their grandparents or their husbands. They suffer from domestic violence. In Brazil, the coronavirus pandemic had a female face, but also darker because of the racial inequalities. Younger, much younger, the victims, the people who died, didn't have to wait until they were 70 or 80 because they had comorbidities, diseases that could have been prevented but were not. Therefore, younger, darker, female, poorer, much poorer, the majority of the victims were the poor people living in the periphery in our favela. And all this was met by lack of empathy, solidarity, compassion by our authorities. The greatest sanitary crisis of our time, of our history, met with apathy. <laughs> our leaders in total denial, a lot of corruption, is stealing critical resources like ventilators, oxygen, hospital beds, people getting richer because of the pandemic. All that punctuated by 
healthy literacy and science literacy by our leaders. Some have already suggested, not only in Brazil, but outside, that what has happened here is a crime against humanity that could end up in The Hague, but the International Tribune. All this under the culture of move fast and break things. Pernicious. This culture that we have to make things happen, progress. Profits. It came from the Valley of Silk. It came from the big CEOs of technology. When in fact we should start to think about the legacy of this pandemic to move more slowly and put the house in order. In our Afro-Brazilian culture, there are two divinities that could express this so well. One is young and intrepid and rapid and quick, and he doesn't care if behind him there will be left a mess. But then comes another one, Oxalufan. And we'll put everything that Oxagian, the young one, had left behind, and which discipline and method will rearrange the world. This is what we need. We need to learn from the pandemic to understand and value the importance of us, old people. But what I want to focus to point, or today here with you, is the focus on residential care, long-term facilities. There was total lack of response from the government. If we would depend on the government, on the Minister of Health, on the ministry that was created to deal with COVID and denial, many more thousands of deaths would have occurred. They didn't issue one single guideline until 18 months after the beginning of the pandemic. But we have so, so civil society. And I'm proud to say, as president of the International Longevity Center Brazil, that the process was led by our vice president, Dr. Carla Giacomo, respected geriatrician from Belo Horizonte. Previously, she had the experience of being the president of the National Council on the Rights of Older People, and today we don't have a national council for the people because our president made an intervention and abolished what was democratically elected council. In this vacuum, Carla, in March 2020, days after the first case of COVID in Brazil, with her leadership and competence, mobilized civil society, academic groups throughout the country, and very rapidly, 1,200 professionals were mobilized to bring what the government did it, guidelines. Working virtually, not a single presidential meeting, and they established the documents, the instructions, the guidelines that rigid and penetrated with capillarity all residential care facilities in this country. Carla led a group that saved thousands of pets. Because if we would have had the experience that richer countries had, in Italy, in Spain, France, in the United States, in Canada, and so on, it would have been a disaster. And people there, in the interlands, in the distant Amazon, or in the Northeast, 
or residential cares in the poor periphery of our big cities, they knew what to do. With protocols based in science. Yeah. They were in power. And they knew that they had human rights that were being ignored by the government. It's not only health. We need to value the pillars of active aging. We need health, but we need knowledge, lifelong learning to the people that are providing care, to all the people and their families, to deal with unknown who didn't know about COVID. But also we need protection, we need security, but we also need participation. Nothing for us without us. Huh. Yeah, in 2021, Carla was awarded the highest prize on human rights of all the people by the Congress. The award called Zilda Arms, herself Zilda Arms, a champion focus on rights of children who tragically died during the war and the earthquake in Haiti, serving the poor, the destitute. I'm saying this because I believe that examples like this and champions like them are needed to take us from this mess that we have created. We haven't learned enough from the COVID pandemic. We haven't learned the importance of following the United Nations principles of older people, like dignity, autonomy, protagonists. I wish I could call my friend Frida to help me here. Frida, F for fairness, R for rights, E for equality, G for dignity, A for autonomy. Come Frida, help me to bring more fairness, to focus on rights, to talk about equality, to respect dignity, and to give all the people autonomy to make their own decisions. Finally, I want to pay respect to the millions of anonymous people, family members or otherwise ordinary members of the community. Because it's not only the pandemic of coronavirus, this pandemic has shown the pandemic of loneliness, inequality, poverty, and ages. We should stop taking to stock and learn what we haven't learned so far. Other pandemics may come. If, and if we don't be introspective and show discernment, to learn from this experience, the second pandemic will equally kill millions, especially those that are more vulnerable and always among the most vulnerable are older people. But be sure that we are not only vulnerable, we are also more resilient. We, older people, based on our experience of life force, can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I pay respect to these heroes and heroines. What they have done is remarkable, but what our authorities have done, it is, in my opinion, criminal. Thank you.
Well, Alex, that was uh, fantastic. I was really awaiting for your presentation. As usual, you are able to provoke this uh, kind of emotional status that you can in everybody that have the chance to hear. So thank you very much. And, and with this, we are going to finalize our symposium. I don't know if we still have any time for questions, but if there is, please, you might be able to do so. Thank you very much. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, once again, I don't, I cannot see my face, but uh, I'm supposed I am on. And uh, I am Dr. Lia Deichmann, as you probably know. I am from Argentina, from ILC Argentina, and this was a really uh, wonderful symposium that was very difficult to arrange because people here are really very busy and uh, they have to go from one place to another one, from one symposium to another one, and to the council and all that. I hope you really enjoyed our presentations and uh, you. If you didn't have the chance to see it all, they will remain uh, for three months. Uh, you will be able to, to read them and, and to see them for three months. Um, I would like to, to give the floor to Tineke Altma, who is the only one who is with me now uh, from uh, the Netherlands, and uh, she might like to say some words to you. Tineke, please. Thank you, Leah, for uh, organizing this wonderful panel on a very important topic, the protection of human rights of older people during the pandemic. And I think we had some uh, red threat through all the presentations like um, ageism and um, having an eye for the resilience of people um, and I hope this will inspire uh, all of you who were there in this symposium. And thank you again for this wonderful cooperation of the ELC Global Alliance. Okay, it was my pleasure. Uh, it wasn't easy, it was not very easy, but it was my pleasure. And now, uh, as I say once again, if you have the opportunity, Please, you will be able to see the symposium for three months. It will be still um, on, on, the, on the website. And also, if you would like to read the report, which is really very, very good, that was produced by the ILC Global Alliance uh, regarding what happened with COVID uh, in all the countries that uh, we belong to the Global Alliance, you will be able to go to www.ilcglobalalliance.org. So thank you very much. It was my pleasure. And thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.